I've always been fascinated by stories of companies that made it big and companies that have been successful and then went broke. Let's just think of some of those. Pan American Airlines. I stood in the San Francisco International Airport when the first commercial 747 took off, filled with passengers, Pan American Airlines. Now it's gone. Enron. It was a huge company. They went broke, mostly over fraud and dishonesty. Kodak. They used to rule the film industry. 1973, they hired a 22-year-old right out of college named Stephen Sasson. By 1975, he had invented the digital camera. He presented it to the executives and said, look, we don't need film anymore. We can just store it on the camera, your pictures. Um, or put it in a flash drive. The executives wrongly thought, we're in the film industry, and so they set it off to the side. They wanted to protect their market share. They didn't realize what they really were in were the memory business. So other companies passed them by. And by the time Kodak came out with their first digital camera, they were way far behind. And in 2012, they declared bankruptcy. Circuit City. Radio Shack. Jimboree. Blockbuster. Did you ever go to Blockbuster to get a movie? Toys R Us. Sears. Now their CEO is still trying to pump money into it. They're trying to make it go, but it doesn't look good. Nokia. Remember the Finnish Nokia cell phones? In 2007, they owned a 50% market share. By 2013, they were down to a 3% market share. Apple and Samsung creamed them. All these companies, outcomes they counted on, buckled underneath them. They miscalculated the future and lost. Four years ago, I sprained my ankle water skiing. Now, I know some of you may not believe me. <laughs> Do you remember, uh, remember August uh, 18th, Saturday night, I climbed up on a ladder to the fifth step and I fell. And when I fell, it was on my, our back deck, I immediately knew I'd, it was bad. I could tell I'd broken my wrist. And so Jory and I spent six hours at St. Vincent's. When we drove home that night at 11 p.m., I had just been gone for five weeks. And this was my first Sunday back. And I said, oh, do I really have to tell the church that I broke my wrist doing something so lame as climbing up on a ladder? You know, I was coming, coming in with a sling. And, and Jory says, well, you could tell them you, you, you broke it water skiing and see if anybody believes you. And sure enough, very few of you believed me. <laughs> so the next week, I brought a video. And I showed you a video of me. Uh, starting April 1st until November 1st, I, I try to go once a week to the West Lynn Slalom Course. And uh, if I can fit it in, I go twice a week. And uh, by the way, any of you guys, if you're interested in going uh, with me, I usually go on Fridays, sometimes Mondays, once in a while Saturdays. But, uh, you know, I'm always looking. We've got some excellent water skiers in this church, so it's kind of fun. But anyway, so um, I, uh, uh, so anyway, so I, so, I, so I go there. So the object is to get through the course and get a perfect score. Get around every buoy, that's 14 points. Then you have the boat speed up one mile an hour at a time and you keep going and see how fast you can go with a perfect score. So then I uh, dubbed in a uh, professional water skier and uh, showed him falling. And I said, see, that's it. That's when it happened to me. And uh, come on, there we go. And uh, that's when I broke my wrist, okay? So let's, let's be done with any talk about me falling off a ladder. I would never do anything that stupid, <laughs> right? All right, so you may not believe me, but I actually did sprain my ankle water skiing four years ago. So I, uh, the, the boots are tight. 
They have to be. So if you're going fast enough and you catch it, it just, you know, just right, you will uh, sprain an ankle. So I went to Bart Rask, orthopedic surgeon, and, I, and, and he put me on crutches. And uh, uh, then, I, then he put me in a boot and he said, throw away the crutches. So I remember that day I walked out of his office, my first steps in the boot without the crutches. It was so scary. It can be scary when our crutches are removed. Now and then, God moves in and takes away every crutch but himself. Maybe you've never committed your life to Christ, and it's caused you to wonder why a good God would take away a crutch from you. The Old Testament hero, David, had the experience of having every crutch removed. This is the third in a series of messages called After God's Heart. David is called a man after God's heart. We're asking why was he called that? Because he certainly had a checkered history. And then we're asking the question, how can we have a heart for God? Uh, Saul was the king of Israel and he disobeyed God. He compromised, and so Samuel, the prophet, went to him and said, God is going to remove you as king and anoint a new person to replace you. Then uh, Samuel went to uh, David and anointed him to be the next king of Israel. David was 15 years old at the time. Uh, then uh, the, the Spirit of God came upon David from that time on, and uh, he came out to a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites, and the Philistines had a huge giant named Goliath, and he came out every morning and night and challenged the Israelites, send somebody out to fight me. Why have the whole army fight? Just the two of us. And David heard this, and he says, why doesn't somebody stop him? I'll fight him. God will protect me. And so he went out, and he killed Goliath. Well, he became famous overnight. People of Israel loved him. And uh, so Saul invited him to the palace to work there. And uh, he made him a leader in the army, and David was very successful. Remember, the Spirit of God was upon him. And so the people loved David. And uh, he ate at the king's table. Jonathan, Saul's son, was the apparent heir to the throne. He came to love him. So David had it made. Then one by one, God removed every crutch. First, he loses his position. Uh, turn with me to 1 Samuel 18. If you have your Bible, if you want to use ours, it's on page 286. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, that's Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul is already a troubled soul, prone to angry eruptions, mad enough to eat bees. David's popularity splashed gasoline on Saul's temper. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. He was jealous and suspicious. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. So apparently twice, Saul tried to kill David with the spear. So David fled from the palace. So he loses his position at the palace and as a leader in the army. Second, David loses his wife. Now Saul's daughter, Michal, was in love with David. And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him, and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Saul 
uh, replied, Say to David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. So he said, if you want my daughter, I want you to kill a hundred Philistines. And we need evidence of that. And his hope was that David would be killed. David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins. They counted out the full number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, in marriage. David is successful. Saul's daughter loves David. She becomes his wife. So Saul was jealous and suspicious and he hated David. And he became David's enemy from that day forward. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. Uh, Jonathan was heir apparent to the throne. Uh, but he knew that Samuel had anointed David to be the next king. And he was fine with that. He became David's best friend. Jonathan spoke well of David to his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. What has he done? And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. That's Goliath. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. And so Jonathan told that to David, and David thought, well, maybe I'm okay. Maybe the, the, Saul's not going to try to kill me anymore. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. So this is the third time Saul has tried to kill David. Uh, David the roadrunner stays one he step ahead of Saul. He has to find creative ways to hide and stay away. We've seen many successful companies go out of business because they weren't watching the future. Leaders today have to be nimble and ready to move in new directions. They need to look for new ways to do things. A Legos was a very successful company. For 66 straight years, they made money year after year. Then in 1998, their stock value went from $187 million down to $48 million. They totally miscalculated how the digital world would change the way children play. Well, then Star Wars was coming out with their trilogy, and they contacted Legos. They said, we want to do a movie with you called Legos Star Wars. CEO of Legos didn't like movies. So he said, no way. Over my dead body. Well, his grandson heard about it, and he signed the contract. So Legos is now in the movie business. And uh, they moved, you know, in a different direction. Uh, lots of companies have done that. They've broken the rules and tried new things. How about Uber? A transportation company that owns no cars. How about Airbnb? A travel company that owns no hotels. Then McCall took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment. I don't think I read the next verse. Let's try this. Uh, verse 11 and 12. Uh, Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. All right, then Michal took an idol, laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment, putting some goat's hair at the head. Saul sent men to capture David. Michal said, he's ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me. <coughs> in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to McCall, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? McCall told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? So McCall betrayed David. She said he was going to try to kill me. That wasn't true. And so 
so, uh, Paul, David lost his wife really at that point. They continued to be married, but they slept in different bedrooms. Third, David loses his mentor. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel, Samuel's the prophet, at Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. Remember now, Samuel's the one that records all that we know, or most of what we know about David. First and second Samuel, he, he's the one that writes it. So David is telling him all that's been happening to him. Then he and Samuel went to Nioth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Nioth at Ramah. Then David fled from Nioth at Ramah and went to Jonathan. So at that point, he had to flee from Samuel. He lost his mentor. Fourth, he loses his friend. Then David fled from Nioth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Uh, Jonathan has no answer to give. For no answer exists. Who can justify the rage of a Saul? Who knows why a father torments a child? Or a wife belittles her husband? Or boss pits employees against each other? But they do. Saul's still rage on our planet. Saul's still stalk David's. Never, Jonathan replied, you're not going to die. He's talking to David. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. This is the place at the palace dinner. Then Saul said to his son Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse, that's David, come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away to see my brothers. That is why he has not come to the king's table. Saul's anger flared at Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Josie, Jesse, to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked. But Saul hurled his spear at him, at Jonathan, to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On the second day of the feast, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. This is the sixth attempt on David's life. Uh, so Jonathan goes out. He finds David out hiding out in the country, and he tells him, my father is intent on killing you. You have to go. And so David flees. He loses his friend. God removed every one of David's crutches. David lost his position in the palace, in the army. He lost his wife. He lost his mentor. And he lost his friend. Why does God step in from time to time and remove our crutches? You're married. You think you're going to be married for a lifetime? And now your marriage is over. You're healthy. You're looking forward to a great rest of your life. Then something happens and you lose your health. Whether you're a teenager, single, married, or an empty nester, you will have crutches removed from your life. What can we learn from David about the removal of crutches in our lives? Two things. One, every crutch removed is one of life's most painful experiences. It was painful for David to lose his position, the head of the army, to lose his wife, to lose his mentor, and to lose his friend. Two psychologists did a fascinating study at the University of Michigan a few years ago. They took subjects and they put uh, electro trode caps on them so they could study their, uh, cord uh, their, 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 their brain. And uh, they did it using a uh, simulated uh, betting game. They wanted to see, see the reaction when they won a bet and when they lost a bet. 
what they found was very interesting. They found when they won a bet, uh, there was a rise in positivity in the frontal cortex. But when they had a loss, there was a larger dip in negativity. And they came to the simple conclusion, our losses loom larger than our wins. And I can prove it to you. If you have a review with your boss, your boss tells you 10 things that he or she loves about you, great job on this. And then he says, now there's one area I want you to improve. What do you tell your mate when you go home or your roommate? You talk about that one thing. Our losses loom larger than our wins. So if painful experiences are so difficult for us to handle, why does God allow them? Why does he remove our crutches? God allows suffering because it leads to growth. God used these 10 years where David was on the run from Saul to make him a better man. This leads to the main thing I want you to take away from this message. If you only get one thing, get this. Every crutch removed can be good if it leads us to lean on God. One of the reasons God removes crutches from our lives is to nudge us to lean on him. We were created to depend on God. And when we depend too much on our mate, our friend, or our children, or our parents, or our wealth, or our health, we're moving in the wrong direction from where we need to be with God. Parents, help your son or daughter see that when they have a crutch removed from their lives, God wants to use it to help them lean on him. When we depend on God, we bring glory to him. Ronnie Smith was a chemistry teacher in Texas, and he decided to move his family to Benghazi, Libya, in the middle of the Libyan Revolution. Even though he knew it was very dangerous, he wanted to do something to serve Christ. And so for several years, he taught high school students there and gave them hope when they had little hope. He wanted to serve them like Jesus served the world. And just as they killed Jesus, radical Muslims killed Ronnie Smith. He'd taken a survey just, just a week or two before he was killed. And on it, we learned his motivation for going to Libya was to serve Christ to make a difference in this world. A few months after he was killed, uh, in uh, 2015, uh, ISIS beheaded 21 Christians on the beach of Libya. Uh, they videoed the whole thing so that the world could see and they could bring terror to the world, what they could do. And on the video, we see uh, these Christians mouthing prayers to Jesus and their faith in God. They did it to bring terror to the world. But the reaction of these 21 who were killed, their families had a much different impact. Uh, in an interview with Vice News, the mother of 24-year-old Abanub Ayid said, May God forgive ISIS. But because of them, I gave the best gift to God, my son. The mother of 25-year-old Malak Ibrahim said, I'm proud of my son. He did not change his faith, even up till the last minute. I thank God he's taking care of him. The mother of 29-year-old Samuel Abraham said, We thank ISIS. More people now believe in Christ because of them. ISIS showed what Christian faith really is. The wife of 26-year-old Milad Makin said, ISIS thought they would break our hearts. They did not. Milad is a hero now and an inspiration for the whole world. They not only gave up their crutches, they gave up their very lives. 
They depended on God to the end. David learned to lean on God during these years when he was running from Saul. How do we know that? We know that from the Psalms. There are 150 Psalms in the middle of your Bible. 75 of them are penned by David. In Psalm 13, he writes, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Many of his Psalms he wrote were written during this 10-year period. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I've overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. Even though David knew he was never more than a step away from death, he wrote praises to God. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Even though every crutch had been taken away and he was running for his life, David sang the Lord's praise. This is one of the reasons why David is called a man after God's heart. In the face of despair, he didn't turn away from God. He didn't turn his back to God in bitterness. He leaned in more on God. And this is how you can become a person after God's heart. Don't turn away from God when a crutch is removed in anger. Lean in harder. The American Colony Hotel stands outside Jerusalem, outside the walls of old Jerusalem. And in it, it's a nice hotel and it's a nice restaurant. And uh, on the wall is hanging handwritten lyrics in a picture frame. The writer had no idea that someday the lyrics that he wrote would stand and be an inspiration and become one of the greatest loved hymns the world has ever known. Horatio Spaf Spafford uh, was a successful lawyer and an elder in a Presbyterian church in Chicago. In 1871, he and his wife lost almost everything in the Chicago fire. In 1873, after they'd kind of regrouped he put his wife and four daughters on a ship for Europe. He stayed back to take care of business. And on December 2nd, he got a telegram from his wife. Saved alone. What do I do? And Spafford learned that the ship had collided with a British vessel and had sunk and their four daughters had drowned. So he went to Europe to bring his Anna home. Subsequently, they went to Jerusalem and they uh, started this ministry to meet the needs of people. And uh, um, it became a hostel and then a hotel. And uh, it, it, it meets uh, the needs of people and it, and it serves people. And on the wall are these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. He wrote this when he's on the top of the ship. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. In the midst of tragedy, he too leaned on God. Have you had crutches removed from your life recently? Has it caused you to become bitter toward God? Angry? Or has it caused you to lean in harder on God? Remember, every crutch removed can be good if it causes us to lean on God. Lord God, we thank you for the story of David having everything he depended on removed from his life except you. And how on the run, in desperate situations for years, he learned to trust in you. Maybe you'd like to say something like that to God today. Maybe you've had a crutch removed recently or maybe in your past. 
and you'd like to say, God, I want to lean in on you more in the midst of this. I don't understand it. I don't know how I'm going to get through it, but I'm going to trust in you. Would you tell him right that, that in a prayer right now? Uh, if you've never given your life to Christ, you can say, Christ, I want you in my life. Would you come in? I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose again. Would you come in? And I want to lean on you. So you pray right now.